Um, so paradigms, yes. This this um, this book is a really <clears throat> this is a really good book. It's a book that sold millions of copies. It's a book that um, sort of gets many of us thinking about how science works and what science even is. And I think if we had to just introduce a philosophy of science with one book or one text, you know, nine times out of ten, in nine different worlds out of ten worlds, I would say that it would be this one. Okay? So. There were nine parallel unit, ten parallel universes with this class, and nine of them I choose this book. So, I want to say a little bit about, um, well, science and society. So, many of you are here, you know, you're interested in neuroscience, or in biology, or in psychology, so I don't, I don't think I necessarily have to convince you as much as I have in my intro to philosophy class or in some other classes, what, how, why science is important. And I don't just mean it in, I mean, there's one way to get very turned off by science, you know, it's too mathematical, or it's all these geeks, or there's all this, like, techno stuff that I don't get, or, um, you know, it's, it's like, it, I mean, science, ha you know, can lead to some bad things, and science can also lead to good things, right? It can lead to better medicine. Better, um, better, um, better many things. Anyway, but why? Okay, so I shouldn't have done that. You should have done that. Why didn't I outsource the answers? Because there are no answers. Um, what is going on in the top left hand? What is that? Yeah. Well, Michelle, you've been in the intro, so, so, well, I mean, I guess you can answer, but, yeah, Michelle, go. Are people diagnosing the illnesses in the world? Yeah, so what do you think that might represent? What science might that represent? I mean, this is my interpretation. It could be, yes, say so your name again? Nick. Nick. Ecology? It could be, sure, yeah, it could be ecology. Um, what about ecology? Such as? Such as global warming, uh, uh, depletion of resources, um, deforestation. Yeah. Like Overpopulation, deforestation, loss of biodiversity, etc. Yes. Good. Well, let's say we could diagnose and we found out what was going on. Let's say, I mean, ecologists can't really agree on what good measures of biodiversity are. There are many different measures of biodiversity, for example. Um, but let's even say scientists could agree on what was wrong, and they had sort of a consensus answer to what we should do. Would that be enough? Why not, Aurora? You shake your head. Um, getting the government or anyone to uh, allocate the resources. Right, so then there's all, exactly, so science and society. Then there's all kinds of questions about, even if you knew the answer, how do you get government something? How do you get corporations something, etc.? Can you have your hand up and say anything? Okay. Were you only going to say government? So what's your name? So my name is Bennett. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I kind of looked at the question a little differently because I thought you were referencing the paradigms and how maybe you need to look at the world differently on solutions. Oh, right. We need to look at the world differently to find solutions. And how does that tie in with paradigm? Because paradigms are, it's kind of like a, a whole new way of thinking. Or maybe a, a whole new type of technology that revolutionizes something, makes people think in a different way. Good, I like that. The established system. So what might be old, can you then maybe just make up some terms or make up a characterization for what the old paradigm might be? Or the paradigm, what paradigm are we operating under now? Uh, the assumption that Newtonian uh, physics is correct. The assumption that uh, what we know is right. Yeah, we, I think we always work under that assumption. <laughs> I mean, that's a very natural human thing to do. I think it's not so hot always, but, but, but just going back to this example, 
I thought you were still, I like how you're tying it to paradigm. So what, I'm doing a jump from you, but what paradigm might we be operating under today with the current ecological catastrophe? Yes. Yeah, yeah, global. Okay, but why do we, why do we keep on doing it? Why do we keep, why don't we change things? So what's, yeah. We might have the paradigm that, like, no matter what we do, the earth is going to only bounce back. Exactly. So there's this kind of, maybe there's a hope, I don't know what we would call the paradigm, but sort of a steady state, or like, the earth is going to survive anyway. I was hoping for, other thoughts? What are the, yeah, say your name. It's all valid, but, but yeah, right. I mean, also you say about the resource substitution, so you just always know you complete one, it's always going to be a new one. Right. So if we had to, this is, these are, I, I take all your points and they're great. And so, but they're, you're still telling me like single points, single arguments, single characteristics of sort of a paradigm. And I'm kind of making this up, but I don't think totally. What might the overarching paradigm be that brings all these points together? Resource depletion. Um, that yours is going to bounce back anyway. Um, like what paradigm are all these governments operating? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Th that's the word I'm looking for. Something like the capitalist paradigm. I mean, just this idea. I mean, what capitalism is based on a free market thinking, right? It's based on ne neoliberal economics. It's based on all kinds of externalities to the system that you don't care about because you have to be, you know, infinite resources and this and that. So even in the way that the models are built in, in, in microeconomics and macroeconomics, um, not anymore so much, but certainly the original models, there was sort of, there's all these assumptions about no resource depletion. Um, Maybe, maybe there wasn't so much an assumption of the earth bouncing back, but something like that. Like, you didn't have to take into account the whole work, etc. But that's sort of a, yeah, that's pretty capitalist paradigm, free market. <coughs> something like that, right? Um, and look at how, look, we're so much under the spell of that paradigm that how are we starting, how does the U.S. government talk about solving global change, climate change? They talk about carbon tax. They talk about carbon coupons. It's all capitalist too. The solution itself is a capitalist solution rather than just saying, stop it. <laughs> Let's just put caps, I mean, just stop, stop, I mean, stop production, etc. But anyway, the capitalist paradigm is pretty strong. This one example of paradigm. I like that, and thank you for the connection. What is, and then here, um, Again, I don't feel I need to sell you to the importance of science, and also both the promises and perils of science, right? But I'm just going to read a quote by Sagan. We live in a society exquisitely dependent on science and technology, in which hardly anyone knows anything about science and technology. <laughs> right? And that is true, but you know, it's also true that generally the public doesn't know very much about anything, right? Uh, this old, old cynic P.T. Barnum, circus guy, he used to say, I'm going to say this, I may regret saying it, but I love the quote, never underestimate the stupidity of the American public. <laughs> I just think that's such a memorable quote. I heard it 20 years ago, I never forget it. Um, P.T. Barnum famously said that, the public doesn't know much geography, doesn't know much science, and you know, that's why we have colleges, right? And that's why we're trying to, that's why also we have a class like this that doesn't just teach I actually think a class like this is the perfect class for science, for a college student in science, because it gives you both the, the content of science with the critique of science, right? It gives you both a lot of data, a lot of information, but then also a framework, or different frameworks, a plurality of frameworks in which to understand the strengths and weaknesses the promises and perils of the information you're learning. And I, I, I hope you, you can just at least take away some skill set or some ideas about how um, science, uh, from this class, 
that, you know, to be critical of science, but also to understand its strengths and try to make it better. I mean, it's not all bad, but it's also not all good. Okay. Does anyone know what this picture represents? Down there? In the lower left hand. What kind of science might that be? Animal testing, yes. But what kind of animals? Okay, okay, how evolution? Because, uh, like, it might be wrong, but if I remember correctly, uh, like, there's similar bones in animals and fish that show that they, like, came from a common ancestor. So, the interview. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so it kind of shows that uh, although they look very different, like, I could just imagine, like, maybe a skeletal model of a picture beside that, too. Yeah, so that's going to work for the mouse and for the zebra fish, but that's not going to, your explanation isn't going to work well, for the worm. The worm <laughs> or the fruit fly. Oh, there's a fruit fly Yeah, there's a fruit fly flying. It totally works for evolution. I mean, flies and... But the bones aren't with your right. It does totally work. Other... Ultimately, yes. <laughs> Evolved from the same whoosh line. Yes, correct. But that, it's not quite right what this picture is about. Anyone from my audience? Yeah. Um, all of these um, animals are the model species for the genetic testing. Yeah, exactly. The biology. Mm -hmm. yeah. What's her name? Sydney. 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 So Sydney is exactly right. These are four canonical, actually we have all of them, five canonical creatures. You don't see this guy. This one. This is probably the one you Oh, there's a plant? It's a plant. You know which plant, Sydney? No. No, it's not many. It's the one that there's more labs on working on genetic and developmental stuff than all the other animals combined. Arabidopsis. Yeah. Arabidopsis is a little ugly weed, but we know a lot about it. We know a lot about its genetics and its development and this and that. It seems to be a simpler model. Now, they couldn't put in um, bacteria and such. So these are well known model organisms, as they're called. They're, they stand in for other research for research on us even. So, you know, they each have advantages, like a fruit fly can reproduce very quickly, doesn't really require a lot of food, um, tiny, etc. And you may or may not get the joke, but they're called modern organisms, right? So, that's a catalog. Okay. Sorry, I have to explain it, but um, so it's supposed to be like a model catalog, right? And scientists. There's probably some fake, yeah, there are famous scientists. Anyway, that's not good. Yes, okay. And then another way science can obviously be important is um, with cases of cancer. Looking at cancer and cancer distribution and the price of cancer. Okay. But let me just turn it to you. Take a few minutes in your journal and write down your definition, your characterization of what is science and how does it change. Take a few minutes to do that. Okay, let's hear from people about what science is. Would love to would love to share their answer. Right. Um, I just think of like like hardcore empiricism. That's just the person that pops in my mind. Probably So it's some, okay, so it's a practice, I'm going to put words in your mouth, but it's a practice where we can empirically verify whatever claims we want to make. Some yes. Okay. So empirical verification, that's good. Good. What else? In the back? Um, Maria. Maria. Um, I, I put it like, to me, science is everything like the universe is, like everything it has, but from a, like, a set perspective, you know, um, Okay, well, say a little more about what you mean by most people can acknowledge it. What I mean by most people can acknowledge it is that they can 
thinking is like, I don't know, if you see a chair, like if I were describing like a chair to you, from my perspective, it'd be different, you know, than yours. But we would both agree that it's chairs. Right. Which well, Mike should call that. We can both agree it's a chair. Uh, Common knowledge, I like that, but what other words? Hmm? Objectivity. Well, parent, yeah, who said that? Yeah, okay. Objectivity or common knowledge? Science has an objectivity. And implicitly versus subjectivity. I'm not saying I condone these. I'm not saying I accept these. I actually think there's a lot of subjectivity in science. I think there's a lot of non-empirical stuff happening in science, too. But uh, we're, right now, we're just putting down some of the main things people might think. Building on what Maria says, yeah, objectivity, but methodology, but, but everything has a methodology. So there's got to be like a particular methodology to it. I mean, putting together a stage and setting up a, theater, a play and doing a theater, that involves all kinds of methodologies too, writing a poem involves methodology. Um, and we have to be careful about agreeing and common knowledge because religions have common knowledge too, right? Um, so what, do we, what distinguishes science from religion? That's a very important question also. You had your Thomas, is it? Yeah. Uh, just an idea. Of, uh, it's a study of the interactions from the micro to macro stopping level. Changes that are made parallel to the advancement of those technologies and the mental abilities. Yeah, that's a nice. Yeah, that's a nice definition. Sure. Right now. Yeah. Um, can you repeat it one more time, Tom? Thomas? Science is a study of interactions from a micro to macroscopic level. The changes that are made parallel to the advancement of those technologies and mental abilities. Yeah, I like it. Is knowledge that changes proportionally to our theories and our technology. Yeah, that's good. A few other, is it me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I actually disagree with the science being being common knowledge. I think it's full of unknowns, and I think that scientists, the whole subject, is drive through not knowing. And Excellent. Yes, admit ignorance, admit doubt. There's a lot of ignorance and there's a lot of doubt. Absolutely. I'm so happy you said that. I, I think what the, both Maria and Megan said are not incompatible. I think what Maria was saying was, how do we know, how can we make progress in science, or how do we know when a claim is scientific? Well, it's because it can be verified experimentally and it doesn't matter who you are, but if you just knew enough about how to set up the experiment or something, you could, you would have to come to the same conclusion. Right? Um, yes or no? Because we're not moving. Um, is that yes or no? Um, yes. Okay, good. And Megan is saying, I think what you're saying, Megan, is, um, yeah, that that's fine. That's when about the stuff we know, about the stuff we could know. But behind all of this, the scientist is very curious, very open, ideally very curious, very open-minded, and knows that there's a lot of stuff they don't know. And they're willing to put question marks, they're willing to question all their knowledge and rebuild it. And in that way, science is a lot like philosophy and vice versa. That's, that's, where, that's my kind of people. People who put question marks, ask about stuff, ask about the fundamentals, critique, say, well, really, is it really like that? What if you looked at it this other way? And so forth. But there can still be common empirical knowledge once we get, like, you know, once we get the experiments set up, you know, once we can all agree, like, yeah, you know, the speed of light really is constant. The speed of light really is, you know, three times ten to the ninth meter. But that took a lot of experiment, and you know you have to you have to do it, Marie. But like also, I have to point out that um, not always like the science, uh, the science, you know, question everything. Like philosophy, you can question whatever you want. You yeah, know, but even in philosophy, you don't question.
question. I, I think I know what you're going to say, but continue. I, mean, I just feel like science has like, more restrictions, and yeah. it would be like, closer to Good. religion and that. You know, like, if this is the same question, you get the gravity and shoot. They do all the time. <laughs> hey, you should read more cosmology. Yes. Uh, they, yes. Um, fine, maybe. Uh, no, I actually, I kind of disagree with you, although I shouldn't. Um, to make pro, I mean, this is getting to Kuhn now. To make progress, that we do have to accept a lot of knowledge that's sort of given in time. Agree. Agree. However, there do come moments, and I we're probably at such a moment, where there's a lot of theory that just doesn't quite work out. And cosmology, contemporary cosmology, is a good example of that. There's just all kinds of things I'm not going to go into in this class, it's not a class of physics, where we just don't know a lot of things, and we're really asking very basic questions such as, how did the laws of physics even come to be? And have they always been the same? And sort of a going answer right now is no, the laws of physics have changed over time. That's pretty wild stuff. These are things we use to take as fundamental, like the law of gravity, the, the Newton's universal law of gravitation. That probably has changed over time. Many people are thinking that. But so, you know, that's, but, but I agree that to, to send people to the moon, for example, you wouldn't question the law of gravitation. But, but now, currently in cosmology, you do. Anyway. We should probably go back. We should probably go back. Um, so how does it change? How does, can anyone say something brilliant about how science changes? Do you necessarily agree with Kuhn's model? Right. Um, I do agree with Kuhn's model. And I think that it changes over time. Because like, I want people who don't agree with Kuhn's model. Because okay. Kuhn's model will do in a minute. So, we'll have that under control, I think, but someone who has a different view from our science changes, sorry. Yes, I'm trying to control time. Here. I would say, like, science for practice doesn't really change. Like, um, like ah. you know, the, I mean, we've used the same, like, scientific method <coughs> for a really long time, and um, it depends, like, what it says. The word science, you know. Um, Good. So does, do these properties change? Does I mean, this, uh, does this description or this aspect of science change? And, and there Amy is suggesting, no, this doesn't change. I mean, yeah, it's like the way, like the technology in which we used to verify changes and um, the yep. amount of previous knowledge we had to form hypothesis changes. Right. But in the end, we're still using the same model to test things. So you're going meta on us. You're saying that um, well, I, the paradigms change, but the sort of this basic curiosity. Yeah. Brian, um, Brian in the back, basic idea of empirical verification, the idea that we admit ignorance and we ask questions, that doesn't change. Yeah, like if, yeah. You, if you think about it going from macro philosophy into like our common or uh, current understanding of like what science is, right. the only thing that's I mean, a lot has changed, but ultimately our, our notion of explaining, I mean, Alan Watts kind of said it like, well, he, he uses it, philosophy, he says that science is natural philosophy, and philosophy is man's attempt to explain the world primarily to their intellect. So I feel like mm -hmm. it's just explaining the natural world through intellect and testing. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay, but, all right, so, okay, let, I'm going to ignore the last things you said there. Um, <laughs> I, I'm going to take what I think is pertinent for the class right now. I have to make difficult editorial choices. Uh, is uh, well, no respect at all. Is you are saying it doesn't change, and I like. I think that's a very interesting answer. There is a sense in which science doesn't change because there's a certain attitude. There's a certain scientific empiricist questioning attitude that doesn't change. That's a great, fantastic. Um, but I wanted just someone who might have a model of science that wasn't Kuhn's model of actual scientific change. Maybe that's asking too much. Yeah, go ahead. Was that a hand? No, it wasn't. Okay. What's the sort of typical model that Kuhn starts with? Um, you may remember he talks about this development by accumulation, where I'm going to read a quote. 
If science is the constellation of facts, theories, and methods collected in current texts, then scientists are the men who have striven to contribute to that particular constellation. And history of science becomes a discipline that chronicles both the successive increments and the <coughs> obstacles that have inhibited their accumulation. This is already on page two of the book. He's taking this as one, this is sort of a standard view of how science just accumulates. It just, you know, it's one break at a time. You build this big wall, but it's one break at a time. And you don't, um, you don't ever change like the bottom bricks, you just build on top of them. And science just is the accrual of information. And so by empirical verification, and by admitting ignorance, and by falsifying hypothesis, hypotheses, I'm just going to put that to falsifying hypotheses, and making predictions, these are all properties, sort of, of, of the canonical good scientists. Making predictions. As long as we do this, and we do it over a long enough time, we're going to start building this entire like library of science. We're going to build a web of science, a network of science. That was the standard view. And the positivists who are the generation before Kuhn, you can look them up, logical positivism, you can look it up on Wikipedia, or Stanford's Stanford Wikipedia. Um, they thought that uh, science was a sort of this accumulation of knowledge. And they, the smartest guy of them all is Rudolf Carnap. Uh, other people who are important, I think the most interesting of them all is Neurath, Otto Neurath. They're all German or Austrian. Um, and Reichenbach you might look up to. I give you the name of three dudes you can look up. These are all logical positivists, famous philosophers, totally famous philosophers. And famous scientists, they were buddies with Einstein. I mean, Einstein was buddies with Einstein. I mean, these are smart guys. And they had this view of science as accumulating, and they built, they wanted an encyclopedia. They wanted the encyclopedia of science. I know to you now that seems old because we have Wikipedia. But Wikipedia is like a new thing. And you know, Jerry, Jimmy Wales was not the first person to have ever thought of making an encyclopedia. The 18th century French tradition of encyclopedias, they had this too. And the positivists had encyclopedia. And the funny thing is Kuhn's book, let me see. I think it has the original cover. So, well, uh, I should have brought my. I'll do it. I'll do it on Thursday. Bring my original cover. No, I mean you shouldn't have it. No one should say yes to this. But does anyone have an older edition? No one should say yes. But if you do, oh, you do. <laughs> no, I may not have it. No, but it's the right. This is the right. Oh, you know what? It might fit. No. Anyway, this book appeared in '62 as part of the official work. The name was the the Encyclopedia of Unified Science. That was the name, and it was a large collection of. Um, why did they not? It's so important. The Encyclopedia of Unified Science. So Kuhn, who was buddies with Carnap, look at the beautiful word, Encyclopedia of Unified Science. That's what they believe, the positives believe you could have and should have a unified view of science. Very few of us believe that today, in part because of some <coughs> branches and we have no idea how to unify them, whether you even can unify them. And why should you want to unify them? Maybe at different scales or at different levels of nature, you need to tell different scientific stories. Right? Not right now. Okay, quick. Um, does unification necessitate like a teleological viewpoint? You mean that in the end we'll be unified? Yeah. Um, maybe. Okay. Um, <laughs> There's no simple question. Um, okay. 
But Kuhn published, so see, that's, that's the standard model at the time. Is it for the two? Uh, no, I'm more about the question. So, could you give an example of uh, unified science, <coughs> of the things that can't be unified? The only thing I can think of is uh, with uh, right. Hawking and not uh, the Good. quantum not... and the macro. Right, right. Good. So, we're, we're never going to finish this lecture, it's okay. It's terribly exciting. Okay. All right. Um, see, this, this, is, this is my, this is what I've been thinking about for since I was your age, and I never stopped, and I will never stop thinking about this. Okay. Um, typically, unification also is very closely tied to another notion of reduction. Reduction is when you want to reduce what's happening at a certain level to a lower level. So for example, you reduce the mind to the brain and you reduce the brain to neurons and neuron activities. Or, even though I don't necessarily buy this, I'm just going to say it anyway, you reduce the soul to the mind or the mind to the brain, the brain to the neurons. Okay? And what do you reduce the neurons to then? What's the next one? Elect maybe electrical signals, but, but biochemistry, right? Because neurons are just bags of biomolecules. And then the biomolecules you can reduce to electrical signals or you know physical forces or quantum mechanics. Right? So then you go down to the lowest level, which is something like quantum mechanics. So that ladder of going from the soul, as it were, soul, mind, mind, brain, brain, neurons, neurons, biochemicals, biochemicals, quantum physics. That's the line of reduction. And the big hope among so many scientists still is that all this behavior and all this stuff happening at higher levels will be reduced to the lowest level. That's sort of a, it's a some people call it naturalism, some people call it, you know, scientism. I mean, that's a very strong tendency even today among many scientists, so, so-called reductionism. The contrast often is called holism or anti-reductionism. One mo I've seen you right me once. One motto is, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Whereas a reductionist says, no, the whole just is the sum of its parts which is just the sum of the parts of the sum of the parts, which is just the sum of the parts of the sum of the parts of the sum of the parts. <laughs> See? Until you reach the basement. And the basement are the quarks. And that's where Stephen Hawking comes in, Sarah, and the string theorists come in. You see? That's like the ultimate hope, according to many scientists. But, I'll, but frankly, many scientists also just think that's hogwash, you mean what? You're going to explain how elephants mate and how they like, you know. Are you asking that rhetorically? Well, I mean, if we agree that ignorance and doubt are a critical part uh, of the definition of science. Uh, so for them, I think the ignorance and doubt would just be figuring out how quarks work, how the universe works. All of that. <coughs> Which, you know, admittedly, those are incredibly hard questions. We're incredibly confused about it right now. But then they sort of think, once we figured that out, once we figured out the grand unified theories, etc., then all the rest will come from free. Then the biology, then to explain psychology, and to explain biology, and to explain sociology, and eh, that's just mere epiphenomena. That's just, we'll figure it out once we get to the grand unified theory. Yes? Is it like, is it a common belief that we're, we're going to find I think many, yeah, I think, so I talked to pretty high, I've, I've talked to very highly placed physicists, and I think, yeah, I think many physicists do think that. And in my secret moments and dark moments, I kind of think that too. <laughs> but only on Monday. <laughs> yeah, right. It's just building off that. Maybe you already said that. Is that called, like, the theory, the study of, like, the theory of everything? Yeah. The theory of everything for the grand unified theory. Yeah. That's right. 
So I really, you know, honestly, guys, I have nothing against this. It's as much fun for me, but it just means that we won't cover tooling. So <laughs> I don't know exactly. Um, no, this is great. I mean, I guess that's what BMC is about, right? I mean, I think I'm going down a path, but I never am. <laughs> you guys are just taking a different direction, which is totally fascinating. I mean, I think you get something out of this, too. This was not what I prepared for lecture. But that's okay. Um, but so, I do think it's important to understand. I really do think reduction is a very important concept for you to understand. If you care about science and how these different sciences relate, I think it's, do you at least see the point? I'm not saying you have to accept it, but that nature has these levels. This, this hierarchy. And you know, we might have physics at the bottom, chemistry, biology, psychology, sociology, right? And that's why we get the pecking order, too, of the sciences, right? The physicists think they're, you know, man, right? And biologists have inferiority physics and inferiority, right? So they build mathematical models, you know. um, and then they, et cetera. And sociologists are just, and so are sociologists. Um, okay. Sorry? Yeah, there's an XKCD, an X in which, if I had had, if I thought this was a lecture on this, I would have the XKCD. Because an X, what's that? XKCD, there's a, there's a, a, a female mathematician standing over here. And what, what does she say? Do you remember, John? It's field purity. Uh, yeah, it's called field purity. And then on the far right, there's a mathematician, and she says, oh, hi, guys, I didn't see you. Yeah, that's, that's Yeah, okay. Oh, it's seven, or ten yeah. up. Thank you. All right. Um, any other questions? Do you see the point about reduction? And then you need reduction to have unification. They go hand in hand. Right? But the second you deny reduction, you also are denying unification. And I'm more on that side. And I think my guess is many of you are too, but you know, we, I would love to have a whole course just on the problem of reduction and unification in science. But that's not what we're doing. Okay. Um, so I'm going to just explain this slide, and then you're going to have your break. Okay? Um, this is Kuhn's view, and I think it'll help you to, to have some visualization. And some of you have already seen this in intro. Um, you start with a pair, well, never mind. We're going to ignore for the moment that Kuhn, and I had you skip that chapter. Kuhn actually thinks there's a pre paradigmatic period where it is just like chaos. People can't agree on anything. But we're, I'm just going to gently skip over that. And we're just going to start once there are paradigms. And then it's this cyclical process according to Kuhn. I don't know how that happened. You didn't blow up anything, did you? No. Okay. I remember the picture of this. Are there questions about reduction and unification? Yeah. Um, isn't it kind of two questions whether there are laws, that, like whether there are unified laws that kind of govern us? Everything on like a reductionist level, and then whether we'll ever know those laws yeah. and understand them enough to unify them. Yeah, that's great. That's a, yeah, you are related. Yes, that's that's right. It, it is. Um, they're two separate questions. Um, just just because they exist doesn't mean that we can ever test them and come to understand them through like inquiry or. Building on what Aurora asked, I think. There's almost an article of faith by many scientists that these laws just exist. And one way of framing the debate is that it truly, either way is an article of faith. Whether we think they exist or we think they don't exist. All we know is what we know. And we, it's undetermined. It's indeterminate whether these laws exist. We just don't, I mean, we're not there, not even remotely close. Um, then the question is, what do you bet? Where would you bet in 100 years from now? Um, and there are many theoretical physicists would bet that you would find these sort of unified pattern laws, and then via reduction you would insert, explain upwards. You would explain upwards. And other people, 
not always physicists, typically more biologists, more complex people types, people who are interested in complexity, they think, you know, there's probably, there's probably many different laws, and each, each scale has its own laws. So each hierarchy or each scale. So psychology is going to have maybe a set of laws of regularity. Biochemistry is going to have a set of law regularities. And, and, and quantum mechanics, which is probably not even a real theory anyway, is certainly going to be replaced by a better theory because it doesn't explain anything. <laughs> um, many, many people think, uh, many string theories, et cetera, think. Um, yeah, anyway, that's going to happen soon. The question, yeah, actually, that's an interesting question. The, the, local the local equations or laws of quantum mechanics, it's just that some people think those will percolate upwards and other people think they won't. The, 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 the unificationists think those will percolate upwards and the other ones, um, the anti-reductionists or the holders, think that they won't. Anyway, for those of you doing philosophy in your sections, like uh, Matthias, is, is Matthias? Yeah. Matthias. Matthias and, 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 and Jameson. Um, um, this is something you may be bring up as well, right? Um, this is a cyclical view. A paradigm is great for a while. You get great progress under the paradigm. And then all of a sudden, well it's not all of a sudden, then anomalies get brought up. Anomaly means A, does anyone know from Greek what gnome is, nomos? Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh yeah, it's in the book, right. Law. Yeah, you remember that? Yeah, you read that, right? <laughs> you remember that from the reading? That it's law. It's when there's no expectations or no regularities. When some, op some observation goes against what you expect from the paradigm. And when these anomalies build up, you get into a crisis state. But you need a new paradigm before the old paradigm can be replaced. If there, the paradigm will just keep on going. It's the only game in town. It just keeps on going, trying to not die. But you always need to work under some paradigm, according to Kuhn. So you can't just work without a paradigm. You need something to regulate, to, to norm your expectations. And that's what the paradigm does. But if, it's, if you've gone into a crisis, and there's another way out, there's the new the new hotshot in town. And the new hotshot can convince you, and as we'll see in the, on Thursday, not necessarily by reason, but sometimes by rhetoric, sometimes by power play, then that new paradigm can be, uh, can win out over the old one. And then we have a revolution. So I've given you in three sentences. Okay. Any questions? We'll I'll have more to say about it after the break. Why don't we take a very brief break? So there's going to be a lot of this lecture I'm not going to cover. I'll put it up on e-comments and then you can look at it. I mean, a lot of it is like finding quotes and this and that. Um, but this this was interesting and important. And um, it was a topic that actually I was thinking about doing also. We talked about it, reduction. Reduction was a topic, but it just didn't make it into the final syllabus. So. There you go. Um, let's go back to Kuhn a little bit. And maybe, I mean, also keep in mind that when we're talking about Kuhn, we're not only talking about Kuhn. We're talking about a certain way of looking at science. And it reminds me of, what was your name? We just asked her about Nietzsche. Uh, Michelle. Michelle. Michelle just came up to me and asked me, is Nietzsche important in any of this? And that's an interesting question. In a weird way, the answer is yes, actually. Because Nietzsche is also all about subjectivity and perspective and power. And there's a lot of perspective and power in Kuhn also. So I mentioned this just as one example of how Kuhn is bringing into science a vision of how we can think in terms of um, power structures, Foucault and Nietzsche how we can think in terms of subjectivity, that there isn't, Maria's right that 
many of us think that science is objective, but Kuhn doesn't think. You'll see more as you read the last third of the book that, that Kuhn thinks that science isn't really that objective after all. So there are, even though it seems like I'm only talking about Kuhn, I really am not. I'm talking about a whole, Kuhn is an interesting mix of positivism and relativism. I mean, he is actually an interesting mix of many things, and that's what makes him interesting. One of the many things that makes him interesting, but let's, okay, paradigms. Paradigms, here's a quote, in its established usage of, and I don't think these quotes were always in the readings assigned to you, like I don't think this one was in the reading assigned to you, but you have the book and you can check. In its established usage, a paradigm is an accepted model or pattern, and that aspect of its meaning has enabled me, lacking a better word, to appropriate paradigm here. And Ian Hacking also spends quite a bit of time explaining what paradigm means. Remember what he, I should call him Hacking. He's a friend, so I call him Ian. <laughs> um, but okay. Um, so, amo amas amat, that's how you conjugate um, to love, to laugh. And that's what the word paradigm originally meant. It meant like a pattern to emulate, an example to be inspired by and repeat, something to follow. And we'll get a little bit more into some of the confusions around the term paradigm, but that's something you've already read, right, in hacking, that there's a sense in which the paradigm is a whole set of ideas. And famously, Kuhn, in the appendix of the postscript, I know I'm coming a lot today. I'm going to have to do this. In the postscript, he says a paradigm um, has four things in it. It has the exemplar. This is, he writes later, he writes in 1970, but it's such a good way to put it. It has the laws, it has the ontological assumptions, I should have put this up there, and it has the, the, the values. So for Kuhn, a paradigm of what he later calls a disciplinary matrix. He gets so fed up with how people, according to him, have misused this term paradigm that he gives it a new name. He calls it a disciplinary matrix. That's a very academic move. Make it a more obscure <laughs> word. Disciplinary matrix. An exemplar is like one thing to follow. So like in Newtonian mechanics, it might be the inclined plane or a pendulum. It's like, what are these problems that you all learn about? Like, how do we all learn, or, you know, or, 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 or just the Earth's motion around the sun? Like certain key examples that are meant to be generalized to many other examples. So exemplars might be like the inclined plane, <coughs> For the laws are things like F equals MA, um, F equals F, F equals G, M1, F2, or R squared in a law of universal gravitation. Ontological assumptions are like what you think the world is made of. So for Newton, they might be particles, forces, um, gravity, even though he had no idea how gravity worked. Newton famously said, I, don't, I will not feign hypotheses, but if you actually read a lot of Newton, you'll see he really believed it was God. Newton was a theist, and he thought like gravity was God's like sensorium, as he called it. It was God's sense apparatus, it was gravity. Pretty wild man, he was also an alchemist, he thought he could change things into gold. And it was also why he was made the head of the mint in England, because he could figure out when a coin was false, um, when there was even a little bit of non-gold in it. He had ways. He had his ways. Um, he was a brilliant and crazy guy. 
this condition. Values for Kuhn are values that a paradigm has, such as scope, explanatory power, simplicity. There's a few others, but um, fertility, but I don't want to make list them all. These Kuhn takes to be um, virtues, he also calls them, or theoretical virtues, or values that a good paradigm will express. What's interesting, which I won't go into, is some of these values work against each other. So if you have a, if you have a paradigm that's very general, it often has a hard time being very precise. <coughs> because it covers many things, so it can't cover any one thing terribly well. Except if you're a total unificationist, but there, but there are many laws that cover, either the, many laws or, or, or models that cover a lot, but not terribly well, or they cover very little, but then they're very predictable and empirically adequate. That's the law, like you said. So what happens when these values work against one another? Then we need different pairs. I mean, the different paradigms can disagree about which values are most important. Kind of like different religions can disagree about which values are most important. Um, so Kuhn has a whole story about what the paradigm as a whole has to do. But he claims when he was writing structure that when he was saying paradigm, he was using it as an example. Hence, the Latin, amo, amas, amat. The conjugation of to love in Latin serves as a template for many other verbs with that same ending. Just so you know French, you know, verbs that end in IR, all, or um, ER, all have, I mean RE, all have the same um, conjugation. For Spanish, AR, IR, ER. Yes, they have different conjugations, but they're all supposed to be the same. Of course, they're exceptions. So those are the exemplars. That's the example. Okay. Um, but Kuhn has some Nietzsche. Oh, no, not really. It's not really Nietzsche. It's more like. Yeah, it would take me a little far afield. Hacking mentions Fleck and some others. So Kuhn was influenced by continental thinkers, people from Germany or France, less so from France. But a lot of this he did think of his own, Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein was important. Yes, I can Wittgenstein is important, who's not a positivist. That's a common confusion. Wittgenstein is anything but a positivist. Um, he was friends with many of the positivists. He hung out with them sometimes, although he thought they were beneath his work. Um, <clears throat> So Kuhn has some Nietzsche in him, and so he says even a paradigm, it's not this easy. It's not Alawa Masamat. Paradigms actually don't have a single univocal, unequivocal interpretation, and they don't have well-defined shared rules. They have some rules, people have some rules in common, but not right. But they're not well necessarily well defined. A little worried about time. Okay. A couple of things that are important about paradigms. I've told you his components later. A couple of things to keep in mind that's important for him with paradigms. What does a paradigm do? Well, a paradigm solves puzzles. This you read, yes? A paradigm spends, it's, it's great. It makes robots out of the scientists, I'm being totally metaphorical and exaggerating, it makes robots out of the scientists so they all think roughly the same way, they can all speak the same language, they share the same commitments, they have the same methods, and then they can solve problems. And he says, paradigms consist mostly in mopping up operations, mopping up operations are what engage most scientists throughout their careers. Here are the three ways that he think what he thinks paradigms do. They determine significant fact, they match facts with theory, and they articulate theory. So you figure out how to 
the facts of the world sort of are, how to match those facts with your theory, and how to articulate the theory. And so then he says, one of the things the scientific community acquires with a paradigm is the criterion for choosing problems that while the paradigm is taken for granted can be assumed to have solutions. He will succeed in solving a puzzle. And Kuhn, I took out some stuff there and I think you read some of it. But Kuhn makes a big point out of saying that they, and he literally uses words like, most of the time they're not going to try to solve cancer, they're not going to try to solve world peace. Because there's no guaranteed solution for cancer. No guaranteed solution for world peace. The scientist wants to work within her paradigm. And the paradigm gives her tools internally to address questions of concern. But the paradigm also selects which questions are the ones worth that. Yes, um, so a paradigm gives you some expectations, because I do want to cover a little bit more of what he says. Uh, I think he gives this example, which I just think is excellent. I mean, I'm not sure I buy it totally, but it's a really nice example. He says, ask a distinguished physicist, he asked a distinguished physicist and an eminent chemist whether a single atom of helium is a molecule. For the chemist, the atom of helium was a molecule because it behaved like one with respect to kinetic theory of gases. For the physicist, the helium atom was not a molecule because it displayed no molecular spectrum. I think, let me just try to explain that a little bit. Do you, see the, do you see the force? The force is that for one person, one person is coming from the kinetic theory of gases. The other person is coming from maybe tools, something about uh, finding the spectrum of these. And then depending on what background theory you have, that is, what background paradigm you have, you are going to um, have certain expectations about whether the, the molecule is, uh, sorry, whether it's a molecule or not. You see that? Other questions about this example? It should strike you. I hope it strikes at least some of you. Who does it strike as kind of cool? So what that's another re good. I'm happy you said that, Amanda. That's another reaction to say, well, but they're just arguing semantics. But then what Kuhn was saying, yeah, but I mean, the paradigm consists of all these assumptions, and he might as well have added concepts. There are all these concepts that get used in very specific ways in these paradigms. And he, you'll see later next on Thursday, he talks about mass. What mass is for the Newtonian physicist is quite strikingly different from what mass is for the Einstein. Because for the Newtonian physicist, mass and energy are just two totally different things. For Einstein and others following him, mass and energy are converted, interconverted. So is that just semantics? Well, but then that's just saying, oh, it's just math. <laughs> It's just numbers, or it's just... But I, I, it's a legit reaction. But I think Kuhn would then, Kuhn and many of us would just say, yeah, but language is very important in how scientists think. And what concepts, like, think of your textbooks in any science, right? Your plant physiology textbook, or your um, neuroscience textbook, or your quantum field theory textbook, you're not right there yet. Um, those all definitions are everywhere. There's all these concepts in there you have to master, just like you have to master some equations in some sciences, just like you have to master some mechanisms. But you need to know what a molecule, and an atom, and a covalent bond, and a ion, ion, etc., is to understand chemistry. So those are concepts. And what Kuhn is saying is different. Two different paradigms have two different networks. Of Even if the same concept is found, like you have molecule here in chemistry and you have molecule down here in physics, what they're tied to and how they're tied to this network of concepts is very different. It's an important point. 
of you know. Um, I always get to this slide and I love it. And it, but then I that, that's a graduate level. Okay. All right. So this now I'm going to give you a little five minutes. Write down some examples of paradigms you see today. Okay. Um, Okay, uh, so is that a religion or is that not a religion? I, yeah, I wanted to connect. 